like to call to order the regular governing board meeting of the Jefferson Elementary School District, April 13, 2016, at 7.02 p.m. Um, could we have members, ple members present, please? <laughs> Shaquille Ali. Here. Manufo Lia Inga Anawai. Marie Brizuela. Here. Clayton Koo. Here. Rebecca Douglas. Here. Um, I'd just like to um, share with the rest of the board. Um, Ms. Manufo Liainga Anoai asked me to let you know um, she's not able to be here. Um, she is out of town at a work related conference um, this week, so it's hard to get here for a meeting. So I told her it would be okay. We all miss one every so often. Okay, and I believe we have some students from Thomas Edison Elementary here to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Please rise. <laughs> Please put your right hand over your heart. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you very much. We'll be seeing you again in a few moments, I believe. Um, if we could take a minute, members of the board, to review our board meeting guidelines. Ready. Um, I'd like we need to approve the agenda. I would like to um, <coughs> remove the closed session item. We will not be holding the closed session. Um, so right. if we could have a motion to approve a slightly modified agenda. I'll make a motion. We approve the agenda with the deletion of item 17, closed session. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And we have at this time a special presentation from the Thomas Edison Roar Project. Um, Risa Bell, principal of Thomas Edison Elementary, and Jamie Natuzzi, student support resource teacher, will present the ROAR report and outcome of their multi monthly multi tiered system of support, teacher roundtable meetings. Students participating will present how they feel about being part of the Roar staff and hand out interview questions for the next issue of the Roar report. <laughs> Good evening, members of the board and cabinet. Thanks for having us here. I'm Risa Bell, the principal of Thomas Edison. And we're going to be talking about our collaboration at Thomas Edison because we believe children are the priority, change is the reality, and collaboration is our strategy. At Thomas Edison, um, when we start imp implementing the MTSS, um, program, the teachers came up with the idea of having an MTSS roundtable. And so it's a teacher collaboration meeting, and they voted on it to have it one, Wednesday a month. And um, <coughs> in it, so teachers will bring up students, and we'll discuss it as a whole staff. And this gives them a the chance to talk to teachers who have had the students in the past, so they know them really well, and get more strategies on how to help the students. And um, so we've been doing this, and one of the ideas that came out of our MTSS roundtable was to create a student-run newspaper, and that's the Roar. This is one of the um, notes that come out of it. Um, Mr. Wan takes notes at every roundtable, and um, the teachers who has the student that we're discussing um, gets right up on what we came up with and different strategies they can use within the classroom. And this is our Roar staff. And Mr. Natuzzi, who runs our Roar newspaper, is going to talk about how he does it. 
So good evening. I'm James Latuzzi, um, teacher of Thomas Edison, uh, and I'm lucky enough uh, to be the student support resource teacher. And so I get to work with lots of different levels, and um, this is a good example of what, what we get to work with. Um, any of you remember a principal named Jose Nieto? Yes. Anyone else yes. remember Jose Nieto? Well, Jose Nieto was a principal a few years back at Thomas Edison, and one year he gave us a book as a gift, and the book was titled Endangered Minds. Mm -hmm. And I can be honest, I didn't read the whole thing, but I just remember <laughs> the title of it mostly. I can tell you this, this, this staff's minds are not endangered at all. This is a group of kids that really come ready to want to learn. Um, they're what we call, as Mrs. Vidar and I were talking the other day, they're teachable, incredibly teachable. And they they want to learn, they ask questions, and um, they get help when they need it. But I'll introduce them right now. This is only, unfortunately, only some of them could be here this evening. Um, so I guess I'll introduce the ones that are here. Yeah. So here we have um, this evening Michaela, Michaela Wu. Why don't you stand up, Michaela? Michaela. Oh, hey. And Grace Zong. Grace. And then, of course, Anthony Nathan as well. Pictured here, but unfortunately not able to make it is um, Juan Esparza, Noah Alvarez, yeah. Abraham Munier, and then Jan, and Alexis Cornejo as well. So, what happens is we meet uh, typically once a week. Sometimes we skip a week, um, and we meet in my room at lunchtime. They give up their recess time, and they come in, and we kind of have little, little meetings, and we talk about um, what we want to put in the newspaper. The goal behind the newspaper was to try to bring not just the students together, but the staff together as well, and for the students to learn a little bit about the staff. And so the paper is broken down into the various sections, and each one of them gets an opportunity to be the editor. Um, and the editor basically, oh, thank you. The, be the editor basically collects all of the articles using the Google Classroom um, <coughs> format as well. And they edit it. And that actually tends to be the hardest job uh, because they're the ones that have to make sure they get the dates and, and everybody's things in. And sometimes it's hard to format it. And they'll speak to those challenges in a few minutes. Um, we also have a lead story, basically, and, and, and usually something that's going on in our school. Uh, we had our talent show, which was our last one. Before that, we had our potluck international dinner. And guess what? You're the lead story for the next one. <laughs> so you might be in our paper next. Uh, and it will probably be out at the end of this, this month. Another section, um, we interview some teachers. We've interviewed the kindergarten teachers, the first grade teachers. And unfortunately, we made a huge mistake in the last edition. And we're going to have to retract that. So they're learning a little bit about um, fact finding as well. We made a mistake with one teacher's favorite meal was not a hamburger, it was Mexican food, I believe. So we'll retract that the next time. Um, we have a section called the Did You Know? And that's typically some trending topics. Uh, we started one with the Kandama. Unfortunately, after the issue came out, the Kandama got banned. I had to ban it. Yeah. Uh, but it wasn't because of the article. It was, it, it was <laughs> very popular. Um, we have an activity section where they each take a turn trying to come up with some kind of activity for the kids to do. Um, last one was a uh, connect the dots that turned into a shamrock. We've had word searches. Um, but they have fun doing that. And then we have a survey section. And you'll, you'll be glad to hear that our survey, this time, you guys don't even know it. The first time we gave a, the, a survey, typically the questions are, you know, what's your favorite lunch meal? And they have some choices to pick. Uh, then we did, what was your favorite sport? And then last month, we did, what was your favorite movie? And last month, we got about 12 responses. We finally figured out that if we put a little dots around the side, maybe the kids will cut it out and they'll stick it in the envelope on my door. This month, we got 75. So we got a lot more um, surveys back this time. And what we'll do next month is we'll kind of give the results of, of what Thomas Edison's favorite movie was based on that. So that's, those are the sections that we have in the newspaper. And as we said, we meet once, uh, maybe once a week. And I just try to, in the beginning, I kind of tried to guide them. And then I was like, no, I'm not going to guide them. I'll, I'll give them some advice. But 
they kind of guide themselves, and it's kind of nice. We have fourth graders and sixth graders, and they're teaming up really nicely to make a, a nice publication. Okay, so what's the next one? Michaela would like to talk a little bit about what it what is the raw report in her mind. So if you give her your attention, come on, Michaela. Okay. Oh, why it's good? Yeah. Sorry. There is a type of a type of why it's good. Why the rural report is good. <laughs> <laughs> um, the rural report is an elementary school student run newspaper that covers all kinds of topics. It includes an article about school wide events, a fun fact section of Did You Know, fun games, surveys, and featuring our very own staff. This is a good influence on our student because it alerts them what's happening. Most students will not take the time to read the papers given to us after school or read the news. Instead, they'll use their, their time to watch YouTube or play video games. This is actually more true than ever because everyone nowadays are absorbed in phones and laptops, e even I. I have wasted my time doing this kind of things. <laughs> but the newspaper is made by our peers, and we know our classmates' interests. We know what will turn them away and what will draw them in further. Once they start reading about school events, they become more interested in these kind of topics. Another reason this is beneficial because it's interactive. Students can participate in surveys or be quoted in the article. Um, I've seen my friends, and they've, they've been quoted and they're actually very excited to be, they're very interested after. Mm -hmm. And then Anthony, Nathan would like to, to, to talk about why we do it. Correct? Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Good evening, my name is Anthony Nathan, and I am privileged to be a part of Thomas Edison's student-ran newspaper. In our newspaper, we include articles about prominent topics that students in our school want to learn more about, such as the ever so, popu such as the ever so popular Golden State Warriors, items that are sweeping the nation, and also about events that take place in our school, such as, such as the talent show and many of our jolly, jolly spirit days. I believe that by making these newspapers, students can keep in touch with not only the things that take place in our school community, but outside of school as well. Reading these articles from a student's perspective is inspiring because it informs readers about outside world topics in a short and easy to understand manner, which triggers one's sense of curiosity. I'm currently in the sixth grade, and I could easily read a newspaper or watch a local news station, but students in the younger grades would not be able to do some of these things. Interactive and meticulous articles give younger re kids the opportunity to learn about important subjects from an early age, which strengthens their knowledge immensely. These articles enhance our abilities to comprehend real-world events with a sense of simplicity. Mm. I greatly appreciate how you, gave, how you gave me some of your time to talk about our school newspaper, which I revel in writing, reading, and sharing with my peers. Thank you. And then last, we have uh, Grace that's going to talk about some of the challenges that we face with it as well. Good evening. My name is Grace Sang. I am part of the Thomas Edison um, Newspaper Committee. A few challenges that the Newspaper Committee faces when writing and editing our papers is not knowing what the students at Thomas Edison Elementary <coughs> would like to read about. A very serious obstacle is getting all age groups um, to want to read our newspaper. We have to cover news that will intrigue first graders, but also look interesting to sixth graders. This is not easy to do, as we would like for our audience to read the whole thing. <laughs> to tackle this problem, we try to avoid making our articles too long, and our editor of the month checks for the t typos and incorrect syntax, but also proofreads our articles to make sure that they are not dull and not too lengthy. We always try to cover people, toys, and games that are appropriate, but are also very popular among our school. In our Did You Know section so far, we've covered Kendama facts, video game information, and some interesting tidbits on the basketball star Stephen Curry. We also face the challenge of a deadline. Since our newspaper is monthly, it does give us a generous amount of time, but sometimes it isn't enough. Sometimes our journalists need to catch up from work on class, and this delays their progress. The editor usually can't do anything until the ri actual writers for the month get their article done. Then, the editor can proofread the article and then format it onto the paper. Which brings me to my next point, formatting. It can be a challenge because on the computer screen it looks perfect, but once we print out a test copy, it's all jumbled up on the paper. Our committee has found a way that works to help with 
formatting, which is simply putting the articles and pictures in a table so they stay where they're supposed to be. It's a pretty nice way to remove this obstacle. Aside from a few problems, the newspaper is fun and educational, not beneficial just to the committee, who are learning to improve their writing and writing in different styles, but also to our audience. The, oh, it extends to our readers, who also can pick a few things up from reading the newspaper, which contains well-written articles. Especially for younger pupils who are starting to learn how to write, it can be very helpful. Thank you for allowing us this time to share with you our student-run newspaper. So we brought um, our interview questions for the, for the um, next issue. And so if you can please fill them out at your leisure, but have them, your deadline is next Wednesday. So. <laughs> you have a deadline also. And there's um, copies of a couple of the newspapers. Thank you very much. Great. Don't go too far away because board members, do you have any questions for either our <coughs> staff members or our <coughs> newspaper, newspaper staff? <laughs> I have more comments than questions, but I, I did have one question. Um, if you could go back to the first slide, please. <laughs> Oh, I guess second. it's the second slide. <laughs> second. Keep going. <laughs> uh, right there. All right. So I was looking at the bottom where it says the newspaper helped all three challenges, academic, social, emotional, and acceleration. I was just wondering more, could you talk about acceleration and exactly what you mean by that? So during our roundtable meetings, um, there were students brought up that have <coughs> need help academically and socially as well. But we also have students that are accelerated, they're above benchmark, and trying to keep them engaged and wanting to happy and interested. And so by having the newspaper and bringing all these students together, the students that were accelerated were able to just run with it. Mm -hmm. And the students that academically needed some pushing, they just jumped in and they want to do really well and it's made them excited about writing and um, coming up with their articles and everything. So it's helped all of them really feel a part of it and working on their academics. All right, great. That's, I, I thought it might have something to do with that. So um, <clears throat> I'm happy to hear that we're doing something to um, address the students that you know are proficient or above. Even, yeah, above. So, all right, that was the only question. The, the rest is all comments. Um, first of all, I was really impressed by your speaking skills, all three of you and your vocabulary. So I guess you're working on that too as part of your <laughs> journalism. Um, information is power and you're, you're putting out information and you're gathering information. So that's great. Um, you're also doing community building by keeping everyone informed of what um, they have in common or even some of the differences. <clears throat> You're learning great skills for future employment, possibly, as well. Um, and you're given your, your, you have a chance to find your voice and to exercise that skill to find your voice. And what I like the most is that you touched on it too, that journalism and newspaper writing and reading is a fading art. And so I'm glad to see that you're picking it, it up and that you're all excited about it. Um, so keep up the great work. Well, I want to uh, congratulate the students that spoke t tonight. You guys were great. And uh, it sounds like you really love what you're doing. And that's really important. And thank you to our principal, Ms. Bell, and uh, staff that helped put this together. It's really nice. I, I do know that students that are able to do something that is considered extracurriculum kind of thing, they excel because it's something that they love, it's something that they really want to do, and that rolls over into being even better in their academics. Mm -hmm. It helps them. And that's why people need sports and music and you know writing and new newspapers. And um, I used to write for the newspaper in my high school, and I know it was really fun because at high school level, you have a little more leeway, but <laughs> but it was uh, it was really something that I enjoyed. So um, I just want to say to everybody 
that um, keep the information going. And that goes for anything that you're doing. The more that you share with people about yourself or about your school, about what you're doing, the more that they're going to come and join you. And that's what we really want to do is be a big family, right? Everybody mm -hmm. together. So thanks for coming. This was really great. And I definitely look forward to this uh, <clears throat> survey. <laughs> I will fill it out. Thank you. Um, I had a question for um, Ms. Bell and Mr. Natuzzi. I noticed that one of the slides you guys talked about having a video newspaper. Could you guys oh, talk about yeah, that? That's right. I missed that. <laughs> Actually, today, uh, Ms. Jennifer Nguyen, our integration technology teacher, came and met with the, the group and actually started teaching them um, a program called We Video. And so we're kind of trying to figure out exactly how we'll implement it, but one of the suggestions that we saw was possibly doing morning announcements using the We Video program. That would be Other, great. Others are interviews and then just simply kind of taking essays and kind of turning an essay into something a little bit different. So um, they kind of, they have access now to, to the program and we're going to meet again in a month with Ms. Nguyen and kind of learn a little bit more how to use it and so we're kind of trying to take it to that multimedia level but slowly. Mm -hmm. Right now we only have eight members of our staff and we've had lots of people <laughs> ask, how do I get in? And right now there's an old TV show called Eight's Enough and okay, right now Eight's <laughs> Enough. <laughs> it's, just, it's just beginning stages. Thank you for asking thank, that. Thank you. That would be cool to see it actually at one of these meetings to see what you guys actually okay. end up doing. We'll work on it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you again for your presentation. You guys were um, great speakers and um, just keep doing what you guys are doing. Just looking at this newsletter, it looks great already. So just keep up the great job. Yeah, and I want to add my thanks to you for coming and to your parents for bringing you um, and for all the others who came out in support. Uh, I think this is a, a wonderful program. Uh, you know, you, you touched on some, some real real world, real work kind of things that you're dealing with. Deadlines, learning to deal with deadlines is, is huge. You gotta, you gotta get there. Um, the challenge you've got of trying to write for such a wide age range is a very real challenge and that you're thinking about it and addressing it is, is really admirable. Um, and I look forward, I think you gave us some samples here, so I look forward to seeing how you, how you did that. Oh, yeah. um, so I just want to say again, congratulations on a, what's a really great program and keep up the good work. Um, and thank you all for, for coming. Stick around. We've got a few more things that you'll want to stick around to see. We're going to be moving on to um, another special presentation, so don't go away yet. Um, I'd just like to comment and thank Mr. Natuzzi and Ms. Bell and the other Thomas Edison staff um, for taking on this product project. Um, not only our students need to be interested in it, but our staff needs to be interested in order to help fulfill the students' desires with the project. So thank you for taking that on and incorporating that into your work day. And um, I thank the students as well. Um, I recognize many of these personalities from the talent show that I was able to view <laughs> a couple of weeks ago. And uh, you guys have quite a lovely group at Thomas Edison. Lovely and lively, I should say, both. All right, thank you. All right, thank you. So, our next presentation is on the spelling bee. I think I see now why we have more young people who haven't spoken to us yet. <laughs> um, Ms. Dews, Assistant Principal of um, Benjamin Franklin Intermediate School and our District Facilitator for the spelling bee will introduce the 2016 spelling bee grade level winners and our District Spelling Bee Champion. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Dina Dews. I'm Vice Principal at Ben Franklin Middle School. Go Falcons! <laughs> <laughs> And uh, Mrs. O'Sullivan and I had the uh, distinct pleasure and um, we were very, very grateful to be able to co-facilitate the District Spelling Bee this year. We are um, very, very grateful and we extend our deepest thanks to our district volunteers, who, one, of them, one of whom was retired and came back to help. Um, and without whose help we could not have had the spelling bee this year. We had 38 students show up that evening with families representing our 14 schools and our volunteers came together and made it happen. So yeah. uh, before we move on to acknowledging our wonderful uh, grade level winners and champion, we wanted to take a few minutes to thank our volunteers, Clayton Koo, Sandy McCulloch, Linda Flynn McNesby, Sasha Saibi, Matt Driscoll, Sandy Leinbarger, Kate Armstrong, and Desjarnay, 
Melanie Aguas, LaDonna Barasa, Marilyn Newman, Kathy Kelly, who came back from retirement, just because I begged her. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you all, and I'm personally grateful again to be able to have um, facilitated the Spelling Bee this year. I would like to, at this time, turn the re remaining um, portion of the presentation over to Mrs. O'Sullivan. Thank you Take very much, Dina, and thank you for guiding me through this wonderful event. Um, and I have the exciting and fun job of introducing our um, grade level winners as well as our champion district winner. Okay, some of our um, students are not here tonight, though. So for fourth grade, we have John Patrick um, Royalis. So is John Patrick is here? Come on up. Good job, John Patrick. Um, John Patrick's winning word was historical. Do you remember that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I'd like to introduce our fifth grade winner, Maya Chan. I'm not sure if Maya is here or not. Come on up, Maya. Come on over. Her winning word was travesty, right? Okay. I bet you've had lots of dreams about that word. <laughs> um, Okay, uh, unfortunately, Jenny Hu, who was our um, sixth grade winner from FDR with the word cheapskate, she's not <laughs> here. She is not here tonight, unfortunately. Um, our seventh grade winner was Matthew Gutierrez from TRP. Come on up, Matthew. <laughs> Your winning word was trifle. trifle. Okay, and last but not least, our eighth grade winner from um, FR was Emerald Wong. Come on up, Emerald Wong. And her winning word was petroglyphs. Okay, so again, we want to congratulate all our, our winners and especially the trophy for our district champion, Matthew Gutierrez. Oh. Okay. Would you like to tell the board what your winning word was? Uh, Do you remember? My winning word was bazooka. Bazooka. <laughs> okay. Spell it. <laughs> Big round of applause. Thank you very much. Congratulations to all the students. Thank you. And we do have some certificates of appreciation. And we also have for our other speakers, which I was being spacey and forgot about. So we'll, we'll give you for the um, spelling bee, and then we'll see our... Um, journalists again in a moment. So go ahead. And we also have some dictionaries being presented um, by uh, the Rotary Beautiful. Club. So nice. um, if, you, if you received them in third grade, maybe you can have two. But maybe if you weren't around in third grade, maybe you didn't get one. So. <laughs> <laughs> I have one for John Patrick Morales. OK. District champion. District champion. Yes. Congratulations. Yeah, yeah if Ms. Lakata can take the FDR. Yeah. For yes, you're accepting on behalf. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Lakata. I bet he's a big basketball star, a basketball fan. That's what, that's what he's doing. <laughs> Thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you. And then I'm going to send you guys back down again to talk to <laughs> our journalists. And let's have our, we'll come back to, back to them. And we also like to offer our appreciation to the students who lead us in the pledge and who come and do special presentations. So we do have certificates for the um, students from uh, um, Thomas Edison as well. <laughs> Grace. of our
our students, in our, wonderful students in our <laughs> We do have the most amazing students here at, at uh, Jefferson Elementary. Yes, I remember where we are. Where are, are you? Where are, <laughs> where are we? <laughs> um, I just want to say to um, both Ms. Dews and Ms. O'Sullivan, um, I spoke to quite a few of the volunteers that evening. They were first time volunteers and they were just so impressed by how things ran and um, their ability to be able to participate and contribute. So thank you for running this event for our students and also for the volunteers who got to experience it. Yeah. Thank you. That's a, a, huge, a huge job organizing it and it does take a lot of volunteers so I really appreciate doing that. I'm sorry I wasn't able to volunteer this year. Um, <laughs> Uh, no, I actually did. I, I, I missed it. It's, it's fun to be at the spelling bee. It's unnerving to listen to them spelling words that I can't spell off the top of my head, at least without a pen and paper. So <laughs> well, in and, and, and all fairness, sometimes the students just get kind of, maybe just the event itself, mm -hmm. and the, as soon as they say a word, spell a word, they realize, oops, it's not right. But it's not about missing the word, it's about participating and just learning all the words that they have to study. They've spent hours on that. So I just want to thank all the students that participate as well as all the people that help them, teachers and parents. Is everything they have to say? I want to thank Ms. Sullivan. She was um, the, the speaker and I was the judge. So <laughs> she's very helpful. So thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> pronouncer, right? Yeah. That's hard. OK. Our next section is communications. Um, and first, for persons wishing to address the board, this portion of the agenda is available for individuals to comment on or address the board on any issue that's under the board's jurisdiction and not on the agenda. The board may not discuss or comment on any I items in this section. The maximum time allowed for any speaker is usually three minutes. Um, and I have here, first off, um, Melinda Dart. Thank you, Melinda Dart, AFT, 3267. <laughs> with, uh, with just a couple announcements, something very wonderful happened this week. Um, and you may have heard uh, the governor, Jerry Brown, and union and legislative leaders all collaborated together to make a deal to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour by January 1st, 2022. And uh, research actually indicates from UC Berkeley Center for Labor that 96% of the affected workers are in their 20s or older and three quarters of the workers are in their 30s or older. Mm. And out of all these impacted workers, 37% are parents. Mm. So we know that this action uh, is long overdue and that it's great that it's finally happening and it's something that uh, our union as well as, as others have worked on. So I'm very happy that that finally came to pass. And I'd like to say congratulations to all the students who did such a great job tonight uh, um, performing and uh, sharing with us and, um, and uh, achieving in the spelling bee. And uh, Elaine Francisco has charged me to remind everyone that we have a parent education night coming up at FDR. Um, and uh, it is uh, a special it's a special evening uh, <coughs> because it falls, um, this month uh, is Autism Awareness Month. And this evening on April 21st at 6 p.m. at 6 p.m. at FDR uh, features a music behavior certified therapist who will talk to the audience that night. So um, it's uh, something that I'm looking forward to hearing about. And I do have flyers here for everyone. And uh, I have some that I can uh, put out uh, or pass around or something like that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dart. And um, Christina Navas um, on National Autism, Aware Autism yeah, Awareness Month. First time. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Sign language will be good. Yeah. No, just kidding. Hi, good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, my name is Christina Navis, and I am a speech pathologist for the district. And I'm here to talk to you about Autism Awareness Month. This is National Autism Awareness Month. Um, and I want to bring awareness to it. So autism is a spectrum disorder, meaning that um, individuals with autism um, have some challenges, but they can also have um, in, like great strengths too. Um, so I wrote just a little blurb that I wanted to read to you guys, if that's okay. <laughs> so um, Autism Awareness Month is symbolized by a blue puzzle piece or you'll see a ribbon with puzzle pieces in it, and that signifies how all these individual pieces or parts of a person make a whole, and we're all individuals, so the, those little parts of us that um, we are really good at, like some are good at sports, like the Warriors, or some people are good at spelling, like our students, or writing, like our students from Thomas Edison, all those little bits and pieces make us who we are. Mm -hmm. um, and you might see these out in the community. So if you do, I want you all to take a second to acknowledge, like, I'm an individual. There are other individuals in the world, but we make up a community here in Daly City. Um, so AutismSociety.org says that autism, like I said, is a spectrum disorder, meaning individuals with autism can vary greatly in their ability and challenges. And autism is really complex developmental disability. Um, signs typically appear in early childhood and um, it's best to, if you have concerns or questions, to get your child checked um, by your pediatrician um, is a great place to start. Hmm. Um, autism also affects individuals' ability to communicate, which is where I would come in as a speech pathologist, um, interacting with others and can possibly affect learning language, difficulty with executive functioning that's like planning or being able to um, predict what might happen next or inference. Uh, individuals with autism might have intense, intense interest like um, lining up items or puzzles or um, airplanes or trains, things like that. And they may use repetitive Language or motor mannerisms, have poor motor skills, lack eye contact, and have sensory sensitivities. Mm -hmm. So sensitivity to light, sensitivity to um, sound, touch, taste, um, and smell. So thinking again that individuals with autism may have some or um, all of these characteristics, um, our community really should come together to support and um, accept and show acceptance of these individuals. And what I am working on is trying to get different um, community um, businesses to participate in National Autism Awareness Month. So I am working with Century Theaters to see if they'll host a sensory friendly movie screening. Okay. Um, so that's in the works. And what that would mean is yeah. For our, um, our community members that have autism or children with autism or even adult with autism, if they're sensory sensitive, then they might not like how loud movie theaters can get or how dark and kind of creepy they can get. Mm -hmm. So I asked the movie theater, will you host us and um, keep the lights up or keep the lights on and um, make the volume less loud? and they said that they would be willing to do that. So that's in the works. Um, it should potentially happen on April 30th. Um, so as that information comes out, I will be spreading it. Um, and yes, so I would like everyone to just acknowledge National Autism Awareness. Um, we are all individuals, but um, it's, it's something that can bring us together too. And lastly, as educators, um, I think a big message for us is that we're not here to cure anyone's autism. This is not something that goes away. We are here to plant seeds of knowledge and who knows where it'll go. And um, that we are charged with all of these beautiful children and eventually they're going to be um, out in this community. So how can we affect that now? 
Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, um, administrator comments. Quick, get your announcements out while there's still somebody to announce. Sure. <laughs> I just wanted to congratulate the Spelling Bee winners again. It was uh, nice to see them. I was in the final round Spelling Bee. I was a judge, and so and I really appreciated Miss O'Sullivan and Miss Dew's um, coordination of the event, and uh, being a judge with Mr. Koo as well. Um, and then also uh, the Thomas Edison students, I'm you know, in the middle, we're working on the LCAP draft right now, and all of these activities that we're talking about are, you know, exemplify our goals, school climate, in family engagement, improved student learning outcomes, and so um, I'm just really proud of all of our staff and students and what they're accomplishing. And while talking about the LCAP next Wednesday, we're having a community meeting um, to look at uh, a draft of the LCAP for the 2016-17 school year. It's going to be at Ben Franklin at 3.30. Um, so we're going to just share our first draft and then we'll share it with the board. Um, we're going to get feedback on the draft and then we'll share it with the board in May. So this uh, Sunday for I guess only my third time in my time here in Jefferson, uh, I attended the Honorary Service Award tea, uh, 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Thank you. 1 o'clock was perfect. 9 o'clock would have been tough. <laughs> um, it, <laughs> but it was really great to see so many different people I hadn't seen in a long time, different uh, former colleagues, principals, actually a couple of people didn't recognize me because when I saw them last my hair was about as long as Rebecca's. <laughs> I still had the beard though. <laughs> but um, with that being said, it was just a great event, great spread. Uh, Marie did a great job as our MC, moving around the different tables and I even was uh, reminded that I did win the Honorary Service Award back in 2002. So it was, uh, I'll make sure I'll dig up my little pin. But it was a great time, thank you. May I jump in? I forgot to mention one thing. Um, Literacy Day was this last Saturday, and Miss <laughs> Jessica Pace and Pat Bohm and their whole team um, coordinated a wonderful event. It was raining, and we still had a good turnout. Um, lots of organizations came and showed um, uh, support for the community. Um, and so I want to thank Miss Pace and Miss Bohm for all their hard work and their team. Um, a lot of folks here were there um, supporting it. So um, I want to thank everyone and thank everyone for coming out. Okay, um, board member, acknowledgements and commendations. Mm, just a quick one, acknowledgement. Um, I was driving down Southgate, and I noticed, I believe the trees have been cut by M.P. Brown School. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know if that's been done in other parts of the district as well, but, um, yeah, I noticed it. <laughs> Could see more of the school, so anyway, good job. Was that for safety, though, or? Yeah, the tree um, program is related to safety. Many of those pine trees are lifespan is 50 years old. Mm -hmm. They're beyond 50 years old. And with the drought, and there's an infested beetle that gets into them. And so we've been trying to be proactive. Um, and we've been able to weather almost all the wind storms this season and not have any fall down, except one that happened on a Saturday night, right, but um, not during a school day. All right, thanks. Appreciate and that's it. Well, I also I attended Literacy Day the night before or the afternoon before. I <laughs> stuffed a, several hundred bags, I think. <laughs> I'm not sure it was quite close to a thousand, but no. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it was fun, and I got to kind of reunite with some folks I had not seen for a while, also volunteers. And uh, what it is is a lot of volunteers came from a church, and um, they were delighted to be able to do something to help our students. And mm. I know I've been sort of always saying we need to find those um, organizations whether it's a church or whether it's a homeowner groups or whatever it is that is willing to come out and help and partner with the schools because it helps a lot and so then also we had as you said the Jefferson Council PTA and we had I think it was close to 80 people there at least that's how many responded and um, uh, it was uh, considered cherry blossom uh, sort of like a Japanese tea affair and uh, it was amazing the food that some of the volunteers brought in was great. So a lot of folks brought food in. Daily and, City. Um, hmm? Daily City style. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's like you know, I always say you have to have more than enough. Because mm -hmm. if you don't have enough, you say, oh, gosh. <laughs> so it was really nice. And it was nice to see, like you said, that some of the retired people that came. Uh, one teacher who worked in our district for many years and retired um, had never even attended one tea all mm. the time. 
And she came and she said, I'll be back next year. <laughs> she just saw so many people and it was just so together. And we had a, a, a little girl that, uh, I wish I brought my program to remember her name, but she did, uh, she modeled a kimono and she was cute as could be. Mm -hmm. Came from Garden Village School. You can brag about her. That's Casey. <laughs> uh, and also we had a boy that did, he's in high school, Jefferson, and he did a, a presentation on karate. Mm. And it was just great to involve the children as well. And, and we had some children that mm. wanted to come with their families to tea. Mr. Uh, <coughs> Dallas was there and Parente, I said Parente, I mean Valente. <laughs> <laughs> names that sound alike, no. And uh, we had a lot of members of the community and we really enjoyed ourselves. So I hope next year we'll get even more people there. And we had lots of teachers and uh, it was wonderful, so. Um, other than I'm just, I knew those other, oh, I wanted to um, uh, ask that we close the meeting in memory of uh, Ms. Wyatt, who was a secretary at, uh, for the City of Daly City and Finance Department, and I know she's attended many events, even our schools, and I'd like to um, close in her memory. Jane, uh, is that her name, Jane Wyatt? W-I-A-R-T-D. W I A R D. Third. No. Okay. I'm glad you spelled that. Cause that's <laughs> quite how I heard it. <laughs> no. I know. I just, it's pronounced differently than what it's spelled. Spelled. Okay. Um, I also attended several of the events that was discussed earlier. I went to the, uh, the Literacy Day Fair. In the past, I've been there as a volunteer, but this time as a school member, it's a very different kind of perspective. <laughs> um, it, was, um, it, was, it, was, it was amazing. There were so many booths and people there volunteering. All the performances were great. So I just want to thank you again for your help on, on the event as well as everybody else who helped out with the event. Um, and I also was at the, uh, on Sunday at the Honorary Service Award Tea Ceremony. And thank you, Ms. Brizuela, for um, being the MC for the event. Um, it was great. There's more food than we could ever imagine ever being there. Um, and it was great to see people there that I've known for the past, as well as uh, one of my teachers from Fernando when I was a student there, and she recognized me. <laughs> so it was great to catch up with people and just uh, thank and recognize all the people for all their work from generations of uh, volunteering and helping out with the school district. I want to add my thanks to all the people who made both of those events happen. Um, great events. Uh, really nice to see at the Literacy Fair. It's, that's moving toward our community schools idea. We had many mm -hmm. community organizations there. We had representatives from the public libraries. Um, and I'm drawing a blank. I, I remember going down the hall and noticing all these different organizations um, and that, that they, were, they were there reaching out to our students to, to let people see what are these services available in, in our community, um, which is what we want to be seeing. Um, like I say, thanks to the volunteers who made those things happen. The nice thing about that HSAT is that it's a chance to see and remember that ongoing tradition of volunteers in our school community and how strong that is. Mm -hmm. um, and so just many thanks to all of, all of them, all the volunteers. Um, Mr. Bedellis, any uh, correspondence or comments? Um, yeah, just a couple. Um, so one, once again, it's just wonderful to see um, the way that some of these LCAP funds are being utilized at the school site level. Um, they, were, they were given to schools to um, identify the ways that they can creatively meet the needs of their students, and it's, um, they're doing a much better job than I can ever do in trying to decide what what's going to work at this particular school. So as we get chances to highlight those programs, we'll bring them to the board and bring them to um, other site principals as well and site councils to learn about what's happening. So thank you, Ms. Bell, for bringing the ROAR project and for having letting your staff sort of um, birth that in a sense um, um, at, the, at the school level. Um, so as you've heard, this is the time in, of busy season um, of events. Every weekend, I'm sure there's an event happening and many nights as well. Um, just wanted to say that um, this coming weekend is MH Tobias Carnival. Um, they do have an auction of many um, highly valued items if you're into those things. Um, I think there's a web, there's a, you can bid on them online as well. So if you're not able to make it, you can peruse their catalog and see if you can make a bid online. Um, 
And I also want to just update the board that I have started looking into the issue that was brought before the board at the last meeting, this issue of the moving of the dispatch center to the county. I've gathered some information. I'm still waiting for some phone calls to be returned, but we'll um, provide that information to the board as I receive it and understand it. Thank you, Mr. Vidalis. Mm -hmm. Okay, this brings us to general functions. I pay the consent agenda. Could we have a motion to approve? I'll make a motion that we approve the consent agenda as presented. I'll second. Okay, could we have a roll call vote, please? Mr. Ali? Aye. Mrs. Brizuela? Aye. Mr. Ku? Aye. Dr. Douglas? Aye. Okay, thank you. And. That brings us to item F, resolution 16-04-13A, classified administrative professionals day. The administration recommends adoption of this resolution designating April 27, 2016 as classified administrative professionals day. Oh, you want we a motion already? <laughs> okay, I'll make a motion. <laughs> Okay, I'll make a motion that we adopt Resolution 1604-13A, Classified Administrative Professionals Day. Do I hear a second? On, on, excuse me, on April 27, 2016. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> second. We've got a second for Mr. Ali. Okay, this is a resolution, so let's have a... Mr. Ali? Aye. Mrs. Brizuela? Aye. Mr. Ku? Aye. Dr. Douglas? Aye. I don't think there's any question mm. that we want to acknowledge our... Amazing oh, classified administrative professionals. So the okay. special thanks for all the yes. work that you do. Yes. So what uh, does it did it does what does it include? Yeah, Under anyone who's the title. Uh, <laughs> what does it include? Uh, it's primarily the administrative support staff of uh, um, administrators. <laughs> so, <laughs> So, ad, ad, well, sure ad, administrative uh, assist, assistance at the school site level, uh, department level, um, throughout the district. Okay. 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 Can we give them a hand? Or we can give them a hand. Yeah. Since we're at that um, item, I'll just want to recognize that Maria, I'm going to thank you for all the. Times that I have to call you and ask you for something <laughs> or for help. She yeah. does and it with a smile. Assistance to the board as well. She so. is, she's <laughs> a sterling example of why we want to acknowledge them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but also anybody else that's in that role, and they also help when we call them. Thank you to all of them. Okay, item G, 2016-17 AFT contract proposal sunshine and schedule of public hearing. A public hearing will be held on April 27, 2016 on AFT Local 3267 contract proposal for the 2016-17 school year. AFT is proposing to open negotiations on Article 2, wages, Article 3, hours of employment, Article 4, health and welfare, Article 7, oops, I'm sorry, that's Article 6, health and welfare, Article 7, leave provisions, and Article 10, class size. The administration recommends acknowledging the receipt of and direct sunshining and distribution for public review of the contract proposal for 2016-17 by AFT Local 3267, as required by the Rota Act. So I believe all we need here is to make a motion to schedule that hearing. Mm -hmm. I'll make a motion to schedule a public hearing uh, to sunshine 2016-2017 uh, AFT contract proposal and to schedule a public hearing. Okay, on, oh, on, a, on, on April 27, 2016, which happens to be classified administrator. Oops. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does. Okay, do we have a second? I'll second. Okay, got a second from Mr. Ku. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And there is no opposition. No. And a similar item H, the 2016-2017 JESD counterproposal to AFT, Local 3267, Sunshine and Schedule of Public Hearing. A public hearing will be held on the JESD's counterproposal to AFT Local 3267 for the 2016-2017 school year on April 27, 2016. JESD is proposing to reopen negotiate on negotiations on Article 2, wages, Article 3, hours of employment, Article 6, health and welfare, and Article 10, class size, and Article 14, early retirement incentives, and discussion on contract language so that it can be updated to reflect revised laws. The administration recommends direct sunshining in time to receive public input. 
the JESD's proposal to AFT Local 3267 for the 2016 school year as directed by the Rota Act. So we need a motion to do the direct sunshining and to schedule the, the oh, actually, no, we don't, uh, don't have to skip. We do need oh, to, to schedule. Yeah. And to schedule the public hearing on the 27th also. So. Well, I'll make a motion <laughs> that, um, that we approve um, the 2016-2017 JESD counter proposal uh, for AFT local 3267 sunshine and schedule a public hearing on April 27, 2016. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposition? Okay. Number I. <laughs> Item I. <laughs> um, local funding initiative polling results update. Representatives from TVWB will report on findings from polling of likely voters conducted by Godby and Associates on the month, during the month of February. The board will discuss next steps, further questions, and consider the local funding initiative exploratory committee's recommendation. Um, yeah, and we have here um, Jeremy, <laughs> and uh, later we'll have we'll hear from Mr. Godby himself, so who conducted the poll, so. So I'm Jeremy Oz from TBWB Strategies. We've been working with your district to determine uh, the feasibility of a potential parcel tax measure. Uh, I was presented in front of your board in February to give you an update on this process. Uh, and since then, we have actually completed the survey. We commissioned Godby Research. And so uh, we are here tonight to present the results. And I'm going to turn it over to Brian, who's going to walk you through um, the news from our survey. Uh, thank you, Jeremy. Uh, members of the board, I'm pleased to be here again this evening to talk to you about uh, what the polling data tells us about uh, a possible potential parcel tax measure. Um, uh, as you know, the purpose of the survey was to look at a variety of different areas. Uh, first of all, to look at perceptions of the district in terms of the quality of education, your management of public funds, uh, and the perceptions for need, the perception of the need for additional funding. Uh, we also looked at the, directly at support for parcel tax measure, and you'll see that a couple times in the presentation. Uh, we looked at various programs and uh, projects that you might fund with the proceeds from a parcel tax. Uh, we looked at both uh, supportive and opposing arguments uh, and statements about the measure. Uh, we also uh, looked at various different rates and durations uh, that voters might support the measure at. Uh, there are a variety of demographic and behavioral characteristics that we have cross tabs for. We won't go into those tonight since uh, that's about a thousand pages and um, <laughs> probably don't have that much time, exciting as they may be. Uh, and then there's also a, a question uh, at the end where we'll address the uh, awareness of the Jefferson High School versus the Jefferson Elementary School Districts and the differences uh, between them. Uh, in terms of the survey methodology, this was different than the survey we did for you four years ago uh, when we could do telephone only. Uh, the world's changed. Landlines are being abandoned uh, at uh, tremendous rates. Uh, cell phones are not necessarily on the voter file, although there are ways to match them. Uh, there are email addresses on the voter file, and there are also ways to match additional email addresses. Uh, with the voter file and so we are doing both a phone survey of landlines that are not disconnected yet, uh, cell phones uh, and uh, an email invitation to an online survey as a hybrid methodology um, and we're finding great success with that in the last two years. Uh, we were, uh, the universe is still voters even though there's a component of matching uh, from those different sources I mentioned at ads and we looked at likely November 2016 voters, it's about 23,000 uh, people in the district. We were in the field from February 19th through the 2nd of March. The average telephone survey was 20 minutes long. We don't know how long it takes online, uh, but we do know that people That's take the survey time. 24 hours a day. Uh, they start and they stop, they start again and they stop and they finish. Uh, and, and the real point is that unlike the windows that were limited to calling people, they can take the survey anytime they want. So we're learning to communicate with them in the survey world uh, on their time frame, not on ours. Uh, and I think that's an important uh, innovation. Uh, 
the average uh, sam or the sample size was 300. Uh, we did 59 online and 241 via phone, uh, and that gives us an error rate of 5.62 percent, uh, plus or minus. Uh, jumping in then to the key findings, uh, the first section is that climate section where we talked about the district's quality of education, managing public funds, and need for additional funds. Uh, the way we look at each of these questions uh, is similar. Uh, we ask people, do they have a very favorable, somewhat favorable, somewhat unfavorable, very unfavorable opinion in this case of the district's quality of education. Uh, for analytical purposes, we aggregate the very and somewhat on each side of the equation together. So you can see in the box on the lower left-hand side, 46% had a favorable opinion. 11% had an unfavorable opinion. That's a positive to negative ratio of 3.9 to 1. Uh, that's actually a pretty good place to be. Uh, we've been successful with parcel tax measures uh, as low as 1.9 to 1. Uh, so relatively speaking, you're in good shape. Uh, the thing that is important to note here, though, is there's also 42% who are not sure. Um, and uh, this is obviously a measure that we're talking about that would help the uh, fund the programs for the to maintain the quality of education and improve it. Um, and so these people need to understand where you are uh, and that you're doing a good job. We can't leave 42% of the likely voters uh, with a don't know on election day. The next question uh, is, again, the favorable, unfavorable with respect to the management of public funds and taxpayer dollars. Uh, same sort of analysis here. We look at the total uh, favorable or unfavorable, which here you see it's 45 percent in round numbers favorable, 16 percent in rounded numbers unfavorable. That's a 2.9 to 1 ratio. Uh, and that's also a pretty good place to be. We've been successful with parcel tax measures uh, at 0.9 to 1. Uh, so you're clearly above that. But again, the same caveat is 40% are not sure. And this is really important because you're going to be asking them for more taxpayer funds. And so they need to have a feeling that you've done a good job. So there is work to be done. Uh, to make sure these people know what efforts you've gone to uh, in the past uh, to make sure both quality of education is as high as possible and that you're being uh, prudent and fiscally responsible with their funds. The next question in this series was an agree-disagree statement, so it's a little bit different. Uh, here we're asking people, do you agree that the district needs additional funding to do its job providing a quality education? Uh, 69% in round numbers agree when you add the strongly and somewhat together that they, you need additional funds. And only 11% uh, disagree. Uh, there's a much smaller not sure here. Uh, that's 21% in round numbers. Uh, obviously, with the two-thirds um, requirement for a parcel tax, it's important, again, that those people understand the needs of the district uh, and not go to the polls on Election Day uh, unsure. And again, to remind you, all of these questions we're asking are of people who are likely voters. So we're not talking about people who won't go to the polls. We're talking about people who will, in fact, vote in the presidential election. The next question switched gears uh, and is our, the first of our ballot questions for the parcel tax measure. And you can see the wording that we asked on the right-hand side of the slide. Uh, it's designed to be as close as possible to what we might actually put on the ballot. It meets the 75-word limit that were required by state law uh, to be within for any sort of ballot question of this nature, uh, as well as having some other legal components to it uh, that uh, are important and you can see in here. But it also talks about what we would do with the money, and those are highlighted by the bullets. Uh, we asked people, were they definitely yes, probably yes, probably no, uh, definitely no or not sure. Uh, again, for analytical purposes and determine feasibility, we aggregate the definitely's and probably's together. And you can see here that we have 72% in round numbers uh, support, 71.7 to be specific. Uh, for a two-thirds measure, that's a great place to start. Uh, no question about that. Um, uh, there's 18 percent in round numbers that are no, and then another 10 percent that are not sure. Uh, obviously, those 10 percent are up in the air. If we look back to the 2012 survey, which you'll remember 
uh, we used in advance of the bond, we did actually a split sample then. Half of the respondents, we talked about a parcel tax, half of them we talked about a bond, and the board decided to put the bond measure on the ballot. But when we look at the numbers in that survey for the parcel tax, you can see that it was 71.8, uh, and we're now 71.7. Uh, those numbers are indistinguishable from each other uh, from a statistical perspective, so I would say that they are virtually identical. <laughs> Uh, the thing that uh, I think is important to note here is there's still a 5.62% error rate. So, you know, our 72% in round numbers really could be as low as 66, which is just a little bit below the two-thirds threshold at 66.6667. Uh, so there's work to be done. And it's important to note that that work needs to focus on that 30% that is probably yes. Well, we asked them, would you vote yes or no, and they said yes. Uh, on the, and particularly on the phone, they said yes first, then probably yes. Uh, they're still not definitive, and we need to make sure that on election day those people stay on board. So that is, in fact, the, the challenge that we have in front of us. It's the challenge uh, for a permissible public information effort by the district. And then there needs to be, obviously, an independent campaign group that comes together outside of the district itself uh, to, uh, to make sure that uh, those people stay on board. But it's a great place to start. Uh, the next set of questions was a variety of items that you see summarized on the left-hand side of the slide. They were asked in a random order. Uh, and we asked, we read the item and said, for example, uh, if you knew the money would go to attract, retain, and train high-quality teachers, would you be much more likely, somewhat more likely, somewhat less likely, much less likely to support the measure? Uh, when we're done with the interviewing, we go back and assign the numeric values that you see across the bottom of the slide, 2, 1, 0, minus 1, minus 2. Uh, so it gives us a scale that runs from a bottom of minus 2 up to a plus 2. Uh, and it's a very nuanced way to prioritize uh, all of these different items. Uh, if we were to just add the much more likelies and somewhat more likelies together, we might get a bias that is best explained if you, one could be 40% much more likely and 10% somewhat more likely. That adds up to 50%. You could also have something that is 10% much more likely and 40% somewhat more likely. That also adds up to 50%. It's not the same 50%. That bias is taken out of this, um, this mean score, uh, as we call it, uh, abstract as it may seem. <laughs> it's much more influential in terms of prioritizing these items. We also look at a 0.2 difference uh, from high to low to define the tiers that you see here. And what that really means is that while there are numeric differences, uh, essentially anything in a tier is statistically tied. Now, uh, when you're putting together a communications effort and trying to explain people about this measure, you need to put one thing in front of the other. You can't say, oh, there's eight things that are tied. Um, so numeric order is the best way to do that, but realizing that essentially they're tied statistically. In our top tier, we again have uh, at the highest level attracting and retaining high quality teachers at 1.44. That also equates to 86% at least somewhat more likely when we add the two together. Uh, protect core academics uh, at 1.40, again, virtually the same level. Maintain literacy instruction to help struggling students at 1.35. Uh, Hands-on science learning opportunities, uh, 1.32. Uh, keep schools safe and well-maintained, 1.31. Provide after-school and summer school programs, 1.25. Enhance art, music and art classes, 1.25. And then finally, in the top tier, upgrade classroom computers and instructional technology at 1.25, which equates to 82%, at least somewhat more likely. So you can see how closely related these are, both in terms of the mean scores as well as the raw percentages um, that they're based on. Uh, the good news is in that top tier, everything is above 80%, so that's wonderful. Uh, those are great things that the, the voters are very supportive of you spending their, uh, their funds on. Uh, the second tier, which I won't read in detail, um, is also very positive, but it's just clearly not as positive as the first tier. It ranges down to 73%, so everything on this list is well above the two-thirds level necessary to pass a, a parcel tax measure, uh, and that's great news, and we've got a lot of good things to work with. 
The next slide looks much the same. <laughs> it's a bit different question. This is supportive statements. Uh, so these are things that are uh, perceived as being positive. Because of that, uh, you'll notice the scale is a little different. It's, there's no less likely side of this equation because it doesn't make sense to somebody who identifies something as a positive that that would make them less likely to support the measure. Uh, so what we've done is we've taken out the scale on the negative side and it's uh, much more likely two, somewhat more likely one, no effect, zero. Um, and what that means is we can still rank these things in a very nuanced fashion. We can still define the tiers the same way we did before. You just can't compare these scores apples to apples with the previous question because it's just a different response category. Um, in our top tier here, ranging from 1.53 down to 1.33, uh, we have a lot of items as well. Uh, some of them are accountability measures. Some of them are uh, academically related. First one, all money raised by this measure will be controlled locally, and the rest of that, which doesn't fit on the slide, is and cannot be taken by the state. 1.53 equates to 84% in round numbers, at least somewhat more likely to support the measure, so that's uh, very highly supported. Uh, all students deserve equal access to a quality education, uh, protect quality academic instruction and core subjects. Uh, our elementary and middle schools are among the lowest funded in the county. Uh, requires independent citizens oversight and audits, another accountability measure. Uh, support for strong after school programs help keep kids out of trouble. Um, all students from different areas of the district uh, get the same opportunities. Uh, no money for administrative salaries, another accountability measure. Uh, it will provide training and planning time for teachers uh, and guarantees dollars for Daly City, Broadmoor, and Coma schools uh, equally. Uh, this top tier ranges, as I said, from 84% down to 75%, at least somewhat more likely. So again, well above the two-thirds threshold necessary to pass a measure. Lots to work with in that, that group. Uh, the second tier ranges then down to 69%, at least somewhat more likely at that 1.18 ranking. Uh, again, positive, above the two-thirds, but just clearly not as influential as the, the top tier. Uh, at that point in the survey, we've talked about the ballot question. Uh, they've had an introduction to it. They've, we've talked about all the things that we might spend the money on. We've talked about the positives. So we come back to them with the ballot question a second time. Uh, and basically, this tells us what happens if in a world where there was no opposition. We may not live in that world, unfortunately, but it, it's important from an analytical perspective uh, to know what happens when people hear all the positives um, and what we're going to spend the money on. And you can see here that the support goes up 6.5% uh, in aggregate on the yes side. Uh, and in fact, the uh, definitely yes goes from 42% to 51%, uh, which is certainly uh, a good numerical change, not statistically significant, but it is certainly going the right direction and what we like to see. Uh, the next set of questions was the opposition statements, because we do live in a world where not everyone agrees. Uh, and so we've asked several um, negatives as well. Uh, the methodology here is the same as it is for the positives. Uh, we don't put a minus sign in front of the numbers to make them seem bad. The higher they are, the worse they are. Uh, and in tier one, we have items such as the school district has too many high paid administrators. Things don't have to be true to be on this list. Um, <laughs> uh, they just have to be things that uh, an opposition candidate campaign might say. Uh, and that 0.8 equates to 49%, at least somewhat more likely to oppose the measure. Uh, so uh, we know that that's potential negative and we've got to have uh, a um, counter to that and we know from the positives that none of the money for administrators is the way you deal with that kind of accountability. Uh, the state is putting a measure on the ballot to renovate, build and repair schools. That's the nine billion dollar um, school bond that's going to be on the statewide ballot in November. Uh, state politicians are asking for uh, sales tax and income tax increases. When we did this, that was the son of Prop 30. It's actually now, uh, we know, just an income tax extension. It's not an increase, uh, but that's the Prop 30 extension, essentially. The average homeowner is already paying more than $600 a year in extra taxes to the school district, uh, and we can't trust the school board to spend the dollars the way they promised. Again, these things don't have to be true. They just have to be things that the opposition might say. Uh, the top tier ranges then from 0.8 to 0.73, uh, 
or 49 percent, at least somewhat more likely to oppose a measure down to 45 percent, clearly above the one-third necessary to defeat a measure. So we have to take these things seriously and have counters to them. I don't think it means that we don't focus on what we know are the important things, uh, but we need to be aware of that. Uh, and then the final item is the money will be just be used to increase teacher salaries, uh, and that 0.64, while it's in the second tier, is just 39 percent, at least somewhat more likely to oppose the measure, so not as negative as the others. So now that we have talked about what we're going to spend the money on, the positives and the negatives, we come back to a final test of our ballot question to see what's happened. Um, and because we're interested in finding out sort of what the upside is, uh, we also find out what the downside is. And what I mean by that is this question is immediately preceded for every voter by the negatives. So this is probably a little more negative than in the real world, because in the real world, some of the people get the positives first, some of the people get the negatives first, and that has an impact on what happens when they walk in on the election booth. This is probably the more conservative estimate. Uh, but what it says is that even after we saw those negatives, which are pretty powerful, uh, we are still at the same 71.9. It's two-tenths of a percent higher. It's, that's virtually indistinguishable uh, statistically. So we're at the same point that we started at. Uh, we are, though, at a higher point among the definitely yeses. It's not, again, statistically significant, but it is certainly something we'd like to see, and we're uh, basically seven points in round numbers higher than we were at the initial test, and it definitely is. Uh, that is a good sign. Uh, it still means, though, that there's that 23 percent that are probably yes, that uh, there needs to be information for, and we talked about them understanding the quality of education and the, uh, the good job you're doing spending taxpayer dollars those sorts of things as well as what we plan to do with the measure. Now that's a great place to be um, on our second test and certainly suggests moving forward. When we put together the questionnaire we didn't know we would wind up there. So we had a couple fallback questions. Uh, the first was from half of the sample that didn't say definitely yes. Uh, and we then asked them, uh, well, what if it was just $58 instead of $68? Uh, and you can see here that the total support doesn't actually move up, and the definitely yes only goes up a little bit. Uh, so moving from 68 to 58 really doesn't have an impact um, on support for the measure and suggests that you could stay at 68 um, and, uh, and be com that's a comfortable place. Now, we also asked the other half, uh, what you thought if it was seven years instead of nine years. Uh, and here we again see not much of a difference, a little bit of a jump in total support, uh, but we do see 3.3 percent increase in the definitely yes. So it's even stronger than our stronger strongest point um, on that third test. So people are actually more, um, a little more susceptible to the, the, the sunset than they are to the tax rate. Uh, again, we didn't know how far we would need to go down, but we also had an alternative that was five years. Uh, and again, you see an increase to 75 percent in total support. Uh, and then in definitely yes, we're up to 52.9, uh, which is four points higher than we were in that third ballot test. Uh, so there it does seem to be some advantage to going a little bit shorter if you're uh, in, a, in a cautious mood and want to be more conservative. But we probably don't, probably don't have to do that. Um, we were in pretty good shape to start with. Uh, the last question that we have uh, also highlights the information needs that uh, have to happen. Uh, and it asks people on whether the high school and elementary districts are run by the same district or, or agency. And uh, what we find here fascinating is uh, a third, 32.4 percent, say they're separate districts. Those are the people that are correct. Uh, the rest of the population either don't know and just said that, not sure, at 34 uh, percent, or 33.6, uh, 34 in round numbers, said they are the same district. So those people have misinformation. Uh, so I think it's important that people not go to the, the polls on election day uh, thinking this is the same district as the high school uh, and thinking and not understanding what you've done for the quality of education and not understanding what you've done to manage uh, taxpayer dollars, uh, those things are important information uh, that needs to get out to them. Uh, by way of summary, and I won't go through all of the bullets, it's for your reading pleasure later, uh, 
but clearly uh, on our ballot tests at 72, 78, and 72 again, uh, we're in pretty good shape for a November measure. Uh, you know, there's a limit to how high you can get um, uh, on any parcel tax, and, and most of them just win narrowly. So uh, this would be a narrow win. Um, in terms of the features of the measure that uh, are again bulleted below, but we looked, talked about earlier, there's probably some that suggest here that we might tweak the ballot question if the board were to decide to put this measure on the ballot. Uh, and then there are a variety of positives which start on this side of this, this slide and then go on that would be important to help people understand what this measure is about, uh, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, but in summary, uh, we think that um, given the two-thirds requirement and uh, the election opportunity that we have in front of us, that the district should uh, begin the process to prepare for that, uh, placing a measure on the ballot, uh, and then the board will have to make a decision uh, sometime over the summer. The deadline is uh, August 12th, and Jeremy will talk more about that in his, his presentation and comments. So I think this is a uh, great report, green light, uh, and you should be moving forward. Uh, happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Any questions from board members? I thought that was, that was very encouraging. Um, you know, the biggest concern is that confusion of, between us and the high school district right. with the high school district floating a, um, a parcel tax. Parcel tax renewal, this, right. In this coming election. I knew people were confused. I didn't realize it was quite that widespread. <laughs> no, it, it always has been, yeah. like, even when it's not an election thing like this. Right. Even just thinking, oh, there are two districts? Right. <laughs> because right. the, the name is the same, except for elementary. Right. And then the other one is union. So I think they think union is being unifi unified, but it's not. Right. So it, there is com some confusion. Mm -hmm. But and it is understandable. It would have helped if we called ourselves, you know, I don't know, George Washington or something. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but yeah. anyway. But um, uh, and the only thing I uh, see is that um, on the ballot measures, is that what you, on yeah. the side there when you had yeah. that, um, is that what you, uh, it's not finalized though, is that what That's you? That's not finalized. That, that would, um, and I think certainly the list of features and the priorities that we tested suggest that we might tweak the bullets a little bit in this uh, and would come back uh, should the board want to move forward with this with a final recommendation on what the ballot The only thing I do. see, and it's sort of like just the way it's worded, is it says that all funds for Daly City, Broadmoor, and Coma Elementary and Middle Schools. Coma doesn't have any schools. However, if you turn it around by saying the students attending or, or, you know, or the schools serving, serving City, yeah. Broadmoor, Coma. Yeah. I don't want to put it in the exact wording, yeah. but yeah. I think you got your, you got what my gist of this yeah. because yeah. Uh, there is no schools in Coma, right. but there are children that live in Coma that attend our schools. Right. Well, one of the things we looked at was that um, what actually is a stronger statement is funds for our local elementary and middle schools that that was a stronger statement with the voters mm -hmm. versus listing mm -hmm. the cities. That's uh, right. Oh, yeah, no. that's right. I yeah. did see that on the... Yeah, on so it actually, but it I, actually I have tested... I disagree on that a little bit because people that... No, I'm just saying... Voting for yeah. Daly City, they don't think that people in Broadmoor can vote. Yeah, I'm just saying that that's what tested yeah. at a higher rate than, than listing out the cities, so I'm not so assigning that, a value. How did that get rated? Um, I forget exactly what it was, but it, but, but it was a higher rated value than um, listing out the city names. Yeah, it was uh, an informational statement that was all local schools deserve equal access to a quality education. That got a 1.47 on the mean score ranking. And then the measure will ensure that Daly City, Broadmoor, and Coma students get the same opportunities okay. as students in neighboring cities. A little bit different. Uh, that got um, 1.36. Uh, is it because of, of of saying Daily City, Broadmoor, and Coma, or is it about what I think is it's, is inside the whole statement? Yeah, I, I say my my take is is just is that it's you know one of them is kind of an easier, more accessible statement in a sense. It's about our students. You know, all students deserve. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think what it could be. Um, and we've seen this elsewhere too. Uh, there's another item in there that's measure guarantees funding for Daly City, Broadmoor, and Coma schools regardless of the outcome of the state measure. That's a little lower. Now that's an entirely different item. But um, I think what, when you say local schools, I know what my local school is. 
-hmm. um, and I don't have to share with those other places that I don't live. Um, and, but local means my school to everybody, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it, maybe it's just an easier and more accessible term, as you said. Yeah, and then, yeah, because I think the other can raise the question, well, who are these Colma schools, you know, or who are these, right. you know, other communities, right. well, my community. Right, so. I'm just interested in my community, yeah. and all politics is local. Right. Um, so. well, semantics is an amazing And we study. also have That's some right. children that live in Pacifica that go to our schools. Right. That's right, yeah. But they, yeah. So another another way to avoid getting anybody feeling left out. Yeah, in our exactly. Local schools. <laughs> three blocks of Pacific. That's right. <laughs> but anyway. Okay. But they vote. Um, but they vote. <laughs> yes. Are there any other questions for Mr. Godby? No. Okay. Well, well, I will, uh, Mr. Hauser has turn it back to slides the chairman. Okay. Oh, a couple right. more slides, and then I. I think we'll need back. about two or three minutes more. Two quick slides. Just okay. want to discuss the next steps. Okay. I have one public comment card. <laughs> Just it's just hidden. <laughs> She's changing the slide there. Okay. Okay. All right. So now that we've received the positive news from Brian, I wanted to take the opportunity to discuss some next steps with you guys. Um, and so first, I'd like to reiterate the recommendation that a sixty-eight dollar uh, parcel tax for nine years is feasible. Uh, and at that rate, uh, back of the envelope calculations, that would generate about one point two million dollars annually in local funding for your school district. Um, so we think that's important. Um, but in terms of next steps, we think initially, uh, now until June, we should really focus our outreach and really telling the good, the good news and the story and the, the plan to pursue parcel tax funding if that is uh, the route you decide to go. Uh, we think that outreach should focus first on internal stakeholders, uh, your PTAs, um, bargaining units, uh, teachers and those uh, closest to the schools uh, for two reasons. First, uh, after June, everyone goes on summer vacation and it's really hard to wrangle everyone together and we think now is a really important uh, opportunity to seize that audience. And second, as was already mentioned, the high school district uh, is pursuing a parcel tax election of their own and ballots mail for that election on May 9th and we really want to not muddle the message. We want to be good partners to that district but we also seen uh, the slide that Brian presented. There's a lot of confusion between the high school district and the elementary school district and we think that communicating during a time uh, when they're communicating is not, is not wise politically. And so we want to focus from now until June on that internal community. Um, on June 22nd, we, we uh, want to present a draft resolution to you for feedback. A part of that resolution would be uh, the 75 word statement that we, we just discussed and is something that we can tweak, but also the full resolution that includes every project or program uh, that a parcel tax could fund. Uh, we only have 75 words in that statement uh, to state programs and there's a lot of legal language that you saw that we have to include, but in the full resolution we can flesh out in a little bit more detail what exactly uh, your parcel tax would fund. Um, in early July, uh, we proposed sending an informational mailer to all registered voters, um, outlining the plan to uh, pursue local funding, and also inviting them to your July 27th board meeting when we would actually adopt a resolution. Um, the reason we do that is for a few reasons. We really want to, in those first two slides that Brian presented, we want to take that slice of the pie of that 40% slice that did not know how to rate your district, and we want to shrink that. We want them to know uh, that, that you have some great programs going on, but we also want them to know that you are pursuing local funding uh, and, and help them understand how that might help you address your needs in your district. Uh, and this next slide just kind of summarizes this process uh, that we're going to undertake over the next few months. As you can see, August 12th is the county deadline to adopt a resolution uh, to qualify for the November ballot. Uh, so over these next few months, we're going to work first to, to build consensus around a measure when, when two-thirds uh, voter approval is required. Uh, it's not enough just to have an us against them mentality. It's really about building community, con community consensus behind a measure, both in your internal stakeholder community that is connected to your schools intimately and, and casting a wider net into the external community that might not be as uh, tuned into the day-to-day -day operations. Uh, and then from there, we will actually build a strong measure um, for the ballot. Uh, as you guys know, a district cannot advocate for or against a parcel tax measure, but there are certainly steps that you can take to build a strong measure uh, that is set up for an independent advocacy campaign to take over uh, and run with. So with that, um, I'll open up for any questions about next steps or process. We decided to, excuse me, go forward with the feasibility study. I don't recall us deciding that we were going after a parcel tax and not a bond measure. Am I 
wrong? Or we no, it was a feasibility tax? study for parcel tax. It was only for parcel yes, tax? Yes, yeah. Because right. we are, we're at our limit right now with bond <laughs> capacity. So. All right. I don't have any questions there. So we're doing all of some of this action stuff during the summer mm -hmm. when some folks are away. Yeah, we, we work with that. So un unfortunately, we're required uh, by law to adopt a resolution before August 12th. Mm -hmm. Oh, I realize uh, so, that. Yeah. I realize and so that. it's. This is going to be a process that school districts and cities and counties throughout the state of California are going to be going through at a similar time. It's also why we think it's really important to send that informational mailer uh, in July to all registered voters so that they know this is a transparent process and that community involvement is a part of it. Um, so that, that's why we aim to do that and it's just the reality of the election schedule uh, that you need to adopt before that August 12th deadline. When you list that you're sending it out to all registered voters and parents. And parents. Aren't they, aren't the parents already, I mean, is that because some parents are not registered voters? Exactly. Okay. So we'll make sure. Okay. Hmm. Well. The only question that comes to my mind is that rhetorical one is, am I the only person who finds it strange that we can put a ballot measure on the ballot but we're then not allowed to support it? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. It's already been a case against yeah. the school district, so we don't want to do what they I know, do. I know. We, we can support it. We just can't spend money on it. <laughs> we can't spend money. And you can re actually, actually resources, actually. Any, time. any district resources whatsoever. Resources, yeah. right. We can support it as individuals. Yes. We that can't support it as a board. Right. But again, like I said, there are steps uh, that in providing information about a potential measure uh, and building the strongest measure possible for the ballot. And this is the process that we found. Right. Uh, works well and and it's one that your district can follow uh, in order to put a strong measure on the ballot. So the one that you're sending out to the um, all the registered voters and parents is that an informational kind of thing of where we're at? Strictly yeah, informational. Yeah, we've done that before. Yeah, yeah and yeah. we actually did that with your district um, last fall. Yeah, uh, it would be a similar of similar nature. It would there'd be more information obviously now about the fact that you are considering pursuing local funding, um, and there would be an invite. A formal invite to the board meeting, whenever it is, we had targeted the July 27th meeting. Uh, it would be an invite to the entire community to attend that hearing, um, so that they could voice their opinion on a local funding. Yeah. So the next steps for us and for as a board um, is that um, I would engage in a series of conversations to determine um, um, what the next steps would look like um, beyond the feas feasibility study, and then I would come to the board at a future meeting uh, to approve uh, moving forward or not moving forward in that direction with, with the information we gather. Mm -hmm. I just have a, um, just a question about the confusion between the two districts mm -hmm. and how much of a, um, I mean, how much that's gonna weigh on whether people are gonna vote for this or not because before I was on the board, and I know Ms. Brizuela can speak to this, mm -hmm. we went after a uh, <laughs> parcel tax and it didn't pass. Mm -hmm. um, so that's still in my mind. Um, because we don't have a overwhelming uh, majority of people that are giving us a favorable response, according to the survey, it's just something that I'm thinking about. Um, so I don't know of any when else up here is thinking well, about that? I'm thinking about that, and I'm thinking that what they're saying about the communication is part of what we need, what we're doing with that is positioning ourselves. We are the elementary district. They are the high school district. Um, the, you know, to, to, because obviously a big chunk of what we need to do is to educate people to recognize that we have two school districts <laughs> in our community, and they both need support. Mm -hmm. um, and that, yes, that does take a chunk out of out of the homeowners. Um, and, and how much is the high school district uh, uh, trying oh, to I ask? Know, I should know. Yeah, they're sending me emails. About I know, they're sending me emails. Uh, uh, give my $60. <laughs> 60. 60. Okay, thank you. And um, there's is nine years, too? Uh, there's is 10, I believe. Oh, okay. The reason why I'm concerned, though, is because they're communicating before us. So I understand the separate communication, yeah, no, but if they're getting the head start, and we're going to come after them. It's a I worry, just and that was part of, I think, what so we ran into last time, too. I think that they, they are also aware that <laughs> there's confusion around the uh, different names of the districts, at least in Daly City. Mm -hmm. um, it may not be so clear in Pacifica or Brisbane or Bayshore where they also serve. 
um, so but um, they do know that they need to distinguish themselves as a high school district. And I'm sure, and I haven't looked at their uh, polling uh, data to see, but I'm sure that they also have a close to 40% of folks who are not sure. So there does need to be a lot of communication. So we can share that information with them, with their campaign committee to make sure that they are aware of that name confusion. Um, I, I actually have seen their polling. Okay. <laughs> you, you, <laughs> you might guess. All right. Um, <clears throat> and I think one of the things that, uh, it, while it is a $60 measure, it's a renewal of 48. And, and I think it's quite clear they will be talking about this as a $12 increase. Oh, I so they're not going to. So they're not going to be positioning you as coming after a $60 increase. It's oh, just I 12. Th they're going to tell everybody 12, 12, 12. That's pretty clear. And, and I would also add that um, it's really why we think the communication over the summer is important, uh, and we would recommend that that com communication be very explicit. In, for example, including photos of elementary and middle school students, which everyone loves anyways. They respond well to that. Uh, but also making very clear that this funding is for local elementary and mm. middle schools. Mm -hmm. And also to your point um, about confusion and them asking for money in June, I think we found in our research in other districts that voters actually have a relatively short memory. And by the time uh, that November comes around, November is going to be a very, very noisy election for many reasons. Uh, if you guys are watching CNN at all, you might mm -hmm. understand why. Um, but we think that uh, that buffer is, is manageable. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. And I do want to call um, our one speaker card, Melinda Dart. Yes, thank you, Melinda Dart, AFT 3267. I believe the time is now or never uh, to try to pass a parcel tax for our district. Um, and the reason is because this election in November is going to have an incredible turnout. And I believe it's going to be a better turnout than the election in June. And I have a very good memory of the parcel tax that didn't pass. Uh, I still uh, wake up and think about it at 3 in the morning. <laughs> and uh, that parcel tax uh, didn't pass in 2008. It was the world's worst timing for running a parcel tax. People were uh, telling us they lost their jobs when we were mm -hmm. calling them to ask them to support it. And it was a mail-in ballot only, and it was only it was the only item on that ballot. Mm -hmm. And they That's had right. to find it and mail it in. Oh. And even then, we we didn't uh, we didn't completely uh, you know fail. We I mean we failed, but we <laughs> failed at the rate of something like fifty five percent, I think. Oh, yeah. uh, which was which was better than you would expect in an election like that. Um, we were at 65, where, 65 percent. Oh, 65. Barely missed it. 67. Oh, okay, okay. So, in other words, even then, people loved their schools and wanted to support them, but everything was stacked against that election. Um, everything is aligning for this election, in in what as far as I can see, and I think we just have to start now saying that, you know, the high schools are promoting a parcel tax right now and we wish them well and we hope that they achieve their goals, but what they get does not help us at all in the elementary schools mm. and they're extending something they've already had, mm -hmm. but we have never had a dedicated funding stream from our community to support the public education here in our community mm -hmm. and we have to have it because we can't count on the fluctuations of the state and, and we need our community to support our schools because the, the schools make the community, right? Mm -hmm. So, and I think they recognize that. We can tell that in the polling results. So, so we need their support. And, and if you work it out to how much it is per day, it isn't all that mm -hmm. much, you know, when you spread that out um, mm -hmm. over a year. So, um, you know, it, it's something that if we get a little bit from every homeowner, Seniors are exempt, right? It doesn't hit any senior citizen. If we get a little bit from every homeowner, it can make a huge difference in supporting our schools. So I say be brave and go for it. All right. Well.
I think that uh, we're probably at the, like you say, a good a good spot because I think we have more um, people that we can uh, bring in to help pass the. Um, last time we didn't have signs. Now we should have signs. There's a lot of things we should do that we didn't do last year. I mean, not last year, but last time. And I think Facebook that. Now too. Yeah, we have Facebook. But we also, I think, thank, uh, I mean, thanks to AFT for all the programs that you've been putting together, gathering parents together. Mm -hmm. I think we're at a different a place there where I think parents want to support and they want to do it. So, uh, you know, I'm just saying I hate doing it in the summertime because I know people are gone. But, yeah, we, well, we, I agree with you. We have to do it. And you can't wait till September when they get back because it's too late. Now, there was a comment that was made by the high school district trustees that wanted our support, mm -hmm. and they said, you help us, and we'll help you. I'll remember that, because they'll all come and help us, too. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I agree with you. Yep. We should go for it. Okay, well, we will eventually hold a vote on that. Yeah, I'll bring um, it up. <laughs> mm -hmm. and Don't miss the 20, July 27th yeah, meeting, anybody. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, okay, so I, that brings us to item D under curriculum and instruction, um, English language development updates. Mr. Benjamin Moser, English language development ELD program director. Yay. Anna Garcia, ELD instruction coach, and Patty Vizcara, ELD TIG teacher, will provide an overview of the annual measurable Same. achievement objectives, California English language development test, self test, and the supplemental <laughs> ELD pilot program, and good heavens. <laughs> More reading. More listen. reading. Yeah, How do you like those booklets? Wow. I know. Oh, that's a new uh, folding a new copy machine. So good evening. <laughs> it's nice. my pleasure to be here tonight with my colleagues as we provide an overview um, from the English Language Development Department. As usual, let's begin with the data before any decisions happen or we want to look at where children are. So as you know, state and federal law requires that school districts administer a test for English language proficiency and to meet annual measurable achievement objectives, the AMAOs. AMAO 1, refers to the percentage of English learners making progress by moving up one language proficiency, at least one language proficiency each year. So the target was 60 and a half percent. And you will see that we met that mm -hmm. in JESD with 62.9 percent. Yeah. AMAO2 is broken into two subgroups. So this refers to the percent of English learners attaining English proficiency as measured by CELT. And this one is referring to um, fewer than five years. And this cohort contains English learners who have been in a language instruction program for less or than five years. And once again, if we look at the target, 24.2%. And our, uh, we definitely met that with 32.4%. As I mentioned, AMAO2 is broken into two groups, and this is the second piece. And this is for, um, this cohort contains English learners who have been in language instruction uh, programs for more than five years. And once again, you can see that we did meet our targets at a district level. So let's look at data in a different manner. And that is what I'd like to do is compare the results of last year's California English Language Development Test to this year's results. The green portion of the pie chart refers or represents students who have moved up one or more proficiency levels. The yellow represents students who have stayed at the same proficiency level, and the red represents students who have dropped a proficiency level. Mm -hmm. So you'll see it's pretty flat. So based on this da data, we have questions which are, what are our next steps as a department and as a district? 
And from my department, of course, we're looking at how can we best prepare our teachers with a really rigorous and interesting curriculum for our students. And so with that, I'd like to now turn it over to Anna Garcia, who's going to walk us through the next section. Can I ask a quick question? Of course. What would, I, I, I'm trying to figure out what would make someone go down a level in their proficiency. Is it that when they go up to the next grade level, the test is different? Yes. Yeah, so right. the, um, it's, the test is in spans. So anybody in TK through first grade, they are given the same test. Now it's oh. scale scored. So if you're a TK, you don't have to have as high a score as a first grader. But then second grade has their own test. And what I hear from the examiners, that is a very difficult jump for the second grade group. Then it's third through fifth, and then sixth through eighth. Mm -hmm. But I will say, what do I do with this? I mean, this is district results. I look at my colleagues in the audience. I break this down by school. I visit with all the principals and I say, let's put a name to each one of these students. So we're not talking numbers, these are, um, these are our students. Mm -hmm. All right. All right, good evening. So good evening. when we start thinking about our next steps, the first step is always to think about who are my students. Before instruction begins, before any lesson planning begins, we ask ourselves two fundamental questions. Who are my students and what is their proficiency level? And these terms, emerging, expanding, bridging, are the new terms in the new ELD standards. And to sort of exemplify these proficiency levels, I'm going to walk you through a familiar story. And um, you'll just have to put sort of your thinking caps on <laughs> as we exemplify what these different proficiency levels look in action. So what would you say? Beginner, intermediate, advanced? Was, was, I mean, for that story? Well, just for this phrase, grandma. Well, how about if we compare it to that one? Right? And you can start to see a, <laughs> perhaps a newcomer, a beginner, we have one word utterances. But already at the second CELT level, we see two simple sentences. We see the introduction of a past tense helping verb, some adjectives, right? Mm -hmm. And here we have students at the expanding level. Uh -huh. Right? And again, you can see introduction of dialogue. Some comparing adjectives, like hairier than, yeah. right? <laughs> and here you can see, obviously, more advanced English. The ears. <laughs> right? That uh, sort of abstract, although, again, the past tense. We see some cause and effect language, because. So you can see how students, there's a lot to learn as you acquire language, and you can see increasing sentence complexity. And finally, we have students that are bridging to English. And you can see that this is quite challenging. The singular possessive, uh, vocabulary, facial hair, and my favorite, the should have been, the modal auxiliary verb with the past parts. <laughs> How's that? Isn't that fun? All right. <laughs> I can geek out on grammar. <laughs> right. OK. So wanted to introduce the way that ELD looks, or how we approach it in Jefferson. And we have two sort of main um, ways that we look at ELD, integrated ELD and designated. So integrated on the left. Content instruction, the content standards are front and center. We say the content standards are in the driver's seat. But obviously, to be able to comprehend and access science, social studies, math, students need to be supported in their language. So language is not ever separate from the content. It's just secondary to those content standards. Designated ELD is a targeted dedicated time where students are grouped by their proficiency level, that emerging, expanding, bridging that we talked about. And during designated ELD, 
students are explicitly taught English language patterns, some grammatical structures, vocabulary. It's very explicit and very targeted to their proficiency level. Down at the bottom, you see some of the curricula that's used in Jefferson. And for example, CM over on the left, Constructing Meaning, is an example of integrated ELD, mostly used in our middle schools, where teachers, science and social studies teachers, support their language learners in that content. This year in, des in Designated ELD, we are piloting a new program called CCLD. And CCLD uh, emphasizes functional language, meaning what is the purpose of language students need. And the goal is to build instructional routines for teaching and providing opportunities to practice language orally and written. So teachers focus on, again, explicitly teaching language patterns, grammatical structures, and vocabulary with really intentional, built into the lesson, opportunities for students to try out the language, play around with the language, and ultimately fluently speak and write. So I'd like to introduce Patty, who's going to show um, some CCLD in action. Hi, good evening. Um, I'm Patty Viscara. I'm a TIC teacher at JFK Elementary, and I have had the pleasure of piloting um, the CCLD program um, this year. So um, I have been working with fifth graders at the intermediate level, and we're working on a unit called How's the Weather? Um, the goal of the unit is to ensure that students gain the necessary language needed to talk, to discuss the weather and different weather situations such as hurricanes, um, tornadoes, and storms. Um, so I'd like to go ahead and show you uh, they're broken down into four different weeks, and each week ends with an assessment. So this is the first week, week one, and it's the assessment. So um, these are, this slide shows the language that we're targeting during this week, and the assessment, let me jump to, is um, a paper copy for the first week, and it's made up of five questions. This is an example of the first question. Um, what I did was I gave my class, uh, my fifth graders, the paper assessment and asked them to answer all five questions. After that, day two, we decided to make it a little more interesting and enhance the um, assessment by uh, including integrating technology. And um, I was able to use what I learned at the professional development in January with Tony Baroni and Jennifer Ewan um, using a green screen effect. Oh. So um, it was fun, I, the kids had fun, and um, I'd like to share that with you. This is the um, app that we used and that um, mm -hmm. Tony and Jennifer had presented at the P professional development. It's called Green Screen by Do Inc. and it works on an iPad. Um, very simple to use, very uh, quick and easy, and the kids loved it. So I'm going to go ahead and click onto the next link, and it should start the video so you can see the students having fun. What is the weather going to be like this week? What should you wear? You should wear layers of coats and snow boots because it is going to, to snow all week. <laughs> So that was the first question. Each pair of students were assigned a question. Um, so we have an example of a second question. This was a second question um, that you can see we're now targeting the region and what, what it will be like in the future. What's the weather going to be in the Pacific region tomorrow? It's going to be chilly in the Pacific region tomorrow and we expect heavy, heavy wind for the rest of the week. <laughs> <laughs> so those are just two of the examples. We had actually a total of five, but we don't want to be here all night because we want to go see the Warriors. And <laughs> so um, we end with that. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask any of us. I don't have any questions, but it um, looks like a lot of fun. And actually, when I was in college, meteorology was one of my favorite classes. Um, really? Yeah. <laughs> My husband will be pleased to hear that. <laughs> That's what he teaches. Oh, cool. All right. Yeah, and, and I, I did learn, though, that 
that um, industry uses technology more than any other industry. Everybody all over the world always wants to know what the weather is, and they're monitoring it constantly. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I like how you utilize that for the instruction. Um, and it actually reminded me of the first presentation we had with the journalism uh, class. That's right. You know, and so. I think that's a good point to make because the CIS ELD program targets different units of interest for the students. Yeah. Um, we did a, dest a, a destination. Um, yeah, virtual field Virtual trip. field trip. And wow. for example, we that class, we we visited the beach and we, we <laughs> used the same effect with the beach so uh, you can imagine what they were doing <laughs> having a good time <laughs> so yeah keep up the great work I, I mean I always love whatever you you know present and show us and <laughs> I really like sentence frames That's, I'm big on that and so anyway um, keep it up yeah thank you so um, is this this same program going on in many of the schools or what so we have this at, boy, not all of our schools. We have, I believe, 19 um, teachers. Oh, okay, um, good. You know, I looked at, you know, what schools have, all schools have a great need, but really what schools could benefit most and have a cohort that we could work with some teams. <laughs> and so we're looking at expanding this next year and bringing on another group. Great. Great. Sounds good. Mm. So yeah, and the purpose behind the pilot year is to just to figure out, you know, what what level of support do the teachers that are implementing this um, more complicated form of English language development, and what level of support is needed, what resources might be needed. Um, I think they're finding great success, and so they they have become sort of ambassadors for the program, um, and, so, and and talking to others about the effects. And I think when um, Mr. Mosier and I we discuss this is. We, we selected some of the schools that had um, kids who would be stalling, so the kids who had the lar more, most yellow, the schools that had the most yellow, um, kids who don't move necessarily from one level to the next, and I think um, as Ms. Fiscara, she's a good example, the, the students tend to stall at that intermediate level, and so the instruction they're getting from Ms. Fiscara, the next round of um, CELT, um, they're going to be able to demonstrate, you know, knowledge of these future tenses and all of these different ways of um, expressing themselves that they didn't have perhaps fluently before. So they'll be able to definitely probably move up to an early advanced, even at a sixth grade test. Mm -hmm. well, having them do it like that on the video is really awesome because it gives them. Right. And, and this is one example. I think you saw the low tech went last year yeah. when you came around and saw us singing a song mm -hmm. in a kindergarten. Right. So what we find though, what I've seen visiting all the schools, children are really enjoying this. So you saw all the grammatical patterns, all the vocabulary that was being taught. Um, kids are coming, I want to go, you yeah. know, to mm -hmm. ELD and make a movie. Yeah, right. exactly, <laughs> oh, exactly. Right. No, it, but it's great. Smile. The smiles on their faces. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your presentation and uh, thanks for all you guys do. Um, I love seeing that tech integration stuff. I think it just it really it, it makes it makes it so much more it makes it so much more lively and active than just seeing the classroom and writing. For, it helps the teacher. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So thank you. That was a, I love that video. Thank you. All right. Thank yeah. you guys thank very you. much. So. Much. so I hope, uh, in case you're wondering, uh, my phone keeps buzzing. I have many helpful friends who are keeping me updated on this one. <laughs> um, at halftime, uh, Warriors are ahead. I think it was 70 to 50. Uh, Steph Curry needed one more three-pointer to hit 400 for the season. So <laughs> we'll watch the end of it. We are Section 12, Classified Personnel, Item A, Retirement. We have the administration recommends approval of the retirement request from Catherine Diane Crowell, School Administrative Assistant at FDR, effective June 18, 2016, and requests that an appropriate resolution be prepared commending her for her years of service with the district. Ms. Crowell has been employed by the district since December 13, 1984. Well, I would like to make a motion that we approve the retirement request from Catherine Diane Kroll, a school administrative assistant at FDR, 
effective June the 18th, 2013, and that an appropriate resolution. 2016. I'm, what did I say, 13? <laughs> oh, God. Sorry. Flashbacks. Um, <laughs> she would like it if she Yeah, 2000. <laughs> no, no, she wants the extra years now. Wait a minute. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, 2016, and that an appropriate resolution be prepared, commending her for her many years of service with the district. And um, go ahead. And use a second. Uh, I will second that. And I will say, all those in favor? Aye. 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 And congratulations, Ms. Crowell, and enjoy retirement. She yeah. has been working for our district since I was an undergraduate. <laughs> well, uh, uh, just to uh, mention, she. <laughs> Good principal. Well, I was going to say that she was you know, a mom in our district, involved in PTA, and there was a time when. Uh, a superintendent, not as bright as our superintendent here, but anyway, <laughs> he recommended closing FDR. There and aren't any as bright as this. Yeah. <laughs> 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 not now. Anyway, and he, they recommended closing FDR, and she headed the, the fight to keep that school open uh -huh. by having everyone come down and park their car and walk over to the school and walk their way across, um, what's that, uh, Skyline Boulevard, with all that traffic and those lights, to see what it would be like for a young child mm -hmm. to be walking home or walking to school if they had to go to school across the highway. And, um, and I give her credit for all that she did, and it, it opened the eyes of many people. That school is needed in that spot no matter what. Mm -hmm. So besides that, she was a real active in PTA and it's done a tremendous amount of um, help in the district. And, be, and then getting a job in the district and spending all that time, uh, she really needs to be commended. All right. That's great. Okay. Section 13, board policies. Item A, board policies, ARs. December 2014, board policy revision, second reading. The board will review and revise board policies and administrative regulations from the December 2014 CSBA board policy revisions as stated in a second reading. I have to say I did find something that needs to be fixed. Um, it's not actually a substantive change, but um, it's on, it's AR 6145.2F. 61? Mm -hmm. 6145, and the page number for the, at least in the digital version is page um, 193. And there's a section that is marked out, scratched out, um, and then we have it start with a new number one. And in the scratching out, it included the introductory sentence that explained why we had a number one. Um, and I can okay, so say that. Oh, okay. Say it again. It's AR. It's AR 6145.2F. Okay. okay. But you might get there faster than I can. Mm -hmm. 45 point. Yeah, I see the introductory statement that should be there, should read, before a student participates in interscholastic athletic activities, a superintendent or designee shall send a notice to the student's parents, guardians, which, and then the first one struck out, um, right. because it's a, it's a high school, I believe. Yeah, I think that's Yeah, right. and then, yeah, then it goes to number one, so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so we just need to re restore that. One, I think we can restore that one, uh, line that one sentence. That explains why. So yeah. did you think? Yeah, I saw it. Okay. I found it. Found it too. I Thank saw you it for too. identifying that. Yeah. Okay, so we get too happy sometimes with strikeouts. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay, so I found something. As I have a, sort of a question on it. It's AR 5141.4D. On the bottom, it's in red. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's talking about where the services can be. And I just wonder, is that the closest place that we have for services for our parents in Belmont? <laughs> okay, so it's 5144 point what? What is point that? Four oh, point D. Point four. Child or. abuse prevention and reporting. Yeah, but I mean, it seems to me, we, don't we have anything closer to home? Uh, no, we do not. That, that's where the county, yeah, the, the county the center parents. is there. That's not for the parents. That's where we report. That's where we send our, oh, that's no, where we mail well, our I mean, reports. We, the parents don't go there. We do? Right. No, we, we mail something there. We mail something. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. I just thought that if it was for the parents to be involved in this, that's too far away. Yeah, they don't okay. want to be there. <laughs> they don't want to be, yeah. Oh, I see. They're in trouble if they're there. <laughs> well, it, it could be one parent going because there's another abuse. Sure. I mean, yeah. Yeah, and it doesn't I mean that abusing parents going to go. Yeah, we're just required to a put in our policies. 
where the report needs to be mailed, and it's on the form as well, so okay. it's just duplicative. Yeah. Okay. So if they do report it, then somebody comes out. Right. Maybe. Uh, investigation. <laughs> That's the idea. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> this struck me as like, geez. Mm -hmm. So are there any other questions? No, I didn't find anything else. Okay, so if, if we don't have any other questions or corrections, could we have a motion to um, approve those policies with the minor adjustment mm -hmm. that I suggested? I'll make that motion to approve it with the one adjustment, with the part that got scratched out. Yeah, yeah. One Unscratch. sentence, yeah. Scratched, to unscratch it, no. Second. Okay. For a second reading. Yes, that was quick for the second. Do you want it for a second reading? We can just approve then and we can move on to the next packet. Yeah, this was the oh. second. This, this was, was the second reading. This was the second one. Yeah, so we can just approve it with, it, with that it. minor yeah. change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, and so we have a motion to approve it. We have a second from Mr. Ali. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposition? That was unanimous. Okay, board member comments, reports, and reflection on the board meeting guidelines. <sighs> focused on we will listen actively to all ideas we will listen openly without preparing responses and we listened well we asked questions and we got our answers thanks uh -huh. mm -hmm. why do we sort of pick the same ones <laughs> <laughs> that's the one I picked but I'm gonna have to say I picked it so mm -hmm. okay we will build upon the ideas oh, wait I'm sorry the next one, one two three four we will listen actively to all ideas. We will listen openly without preparing responses. And I think we, we met that goal. Mm -hmm. uh, I picked, we will bring our best selves to the meetings, being fully present and ready to contribute and be responsible. Um, we were talking a lot about planning for the future and how we could use LCAP and all those, like, those funds, so I thought we were meeting that goal. Mm -hmm. right. And I am... Um, that we will strive to support our district message of showing up by attending meetings, arriving and starting on time, and ending on time. I think we did pretty well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well we're a few we minutes behind our uh, hopeful schedule, but um, yeah, that was, yeah. Hopeful. That was hopeful. <laughs> and sharing with all the children that came made it well worth it. Yes. Yes. And also sharing about um, the language, English language. Right. It was great. And because we are not having a closed session, yeah, not one time. have to address that oh, or address. report out from the closed session. Um, so I would like to adjourn the meeting as Ms. Bruce Wait well requested in um, mem honor of, in memory of Ms. Jane Wired, Wired, Wyatt, Wyatt, Wyatt. Um, from the Daily City Finance Department. So if we could have just a moment of silence. Okay, and this meeting is adjourned. Yeah. 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 My friend. Oh, any any of your wire